What's up, Facebook? How's Facebook. everybody going? We're back uh, in the office today for the first time in two weeks now. We're live, which live. is which is how we normally do it. But you know, Ty, being the uh, international superstar that he is, you know, sometimes he's just not even in the country. So. I've been in the U.S. the last couple of weeks, but I, we've let's see. I did two weeks ago. I was. I see. I've been in. Nine cities in three weeks, I guess, and then I'll be in three more cities next week. It's a tough so. job, and and this is exactly what we talked about: is doing live events and expansion and all that kind of stuff as part of your business model, because that's where entrepreneurship is going. Yeah, and that's actually kind of what we're going to be talking about this morning: uh, how to build out your first and primary business, uh, optimize it. Squeeze everything out of it that you can before you expand and start doing other things. But once you start doing other things, you've created a business that basically runs on its own where you only need to be there 10 to 20% of the time. Uh, and then 80% is, is done and ready for you to review. Right. And I was actually talking to some other media company owners because yeah. I'm not a Photoshop expert. So how am I gonna how am I gonna get someone the best possible you know meme or image that they need? Well, I need to outsource that to the best possible person. Yeah, and and include that into my package. So part of me becoming more of a business owner and less of a solopreneur is talking to people who can fill in those holes in the packages that I offer, so that people are getting the highest quality in all areas of something that I offer. Yeah, absolutely, and, and I, think, I think that we talked about that too. You gotta let go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and the one thing that you can't ever let go of though. And, and some people get, I think, uh, this is the first thing that people do let go and, they, and, and it's the biggest mistake that they can make. What you've got to let go is the transactional part of your business. You've got to be doing what is creating growth, what's building capital, what's creating the most amount of income for you. What you can never let go of is your message, right? You can never outsource your message, which means you can't outsource your actual marketing and the copy that you're doing. Because if you do, you're asking somebody else to, to try you. and convey your message and that will never happen. So what you do is be able to hand off the transactional. So we'll get into that here this morning. Basically, you create a business. Once you make it boring, you can hand it to somebody else. It's scripted. You can hand it off to somebody else. And then we all know we as entrepreneurs don't like to do boring. That's why we're entrepreneurs. We want something new, a new challenge every day. So you make something boring. Once you've made it something boring, you've conquered that challenge. You can hand it off to your team and then you can go create a new challenge. Absolutely. All right, so we'll I get into it. that. Let's go. Coming in fast, relative info, best will smash. Miss out on this, we coming in last. Two step, bringing the end blast. Hey, this is Vanilla Ice, and I'm chilling with my man, Ty Acid. And I want to tell you, one command stop, have a break, and listen. City City Capital is about to throw down. So now you live it, and all cash, cash, baby. <laughs> okay. I have had sellers tell us that we got the deal because we touched their, their property, we touched, and we had marketing. Was. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, that's good information. And I've been kind of experimenting with a little bit of this online because if people are going to use Pat's digital services, Pat needs to be extremely transparent about what he offers, yeah. why it's different to people, and yeah. also in that transparency, what are my strengths? Yeah, you got to be very clear in your message. You're hiring this me is what because I'm of my personality. Right. Exactly. If you want a Photoshop guy, I thought that's part of what you can put out on yeah, the internet. Yeah, yeah. But we want to make sure that people are empowered to be them. I think it's so good that you said that because it's like, I can't be tie for tie. Yeah. I can run the system and I can have fun and I can be a co host, but Ty is the expert in the area that we're talking about. So we have to present you as the expert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can't hand off your message and ex expect somebody else to portray your message and whatever it is that you do right. in the same manner that you would. So anyway, right. so I'll be the expert. Let's, let's get into it a little bit. So one of the first things that so many people get caught up doing is they end up just hiring an assistant to hire an assistant because they either want to start handing off stuff before they're actually ready to hand it off or they don't want to, they're not willing to everything that it takes in order to build a business first and they want to start handing things off early. So there's actually a systematic process about how you're going to go about build a team. 
Okay, so the first thing that you've got to do is you've got to start documenting your transitional process. Okay, so every day, the first for the first 30 days. So in real estate, as a real estate uh, entrepreneur, as a full-time real estate investor, the biggest thing is your your lead generation and your your prospecting of leads, getting deals. Okay, so that's a very transactional process. Everybody goes about it different, different marketing techniques. There's uh, and, and I've gone through that, gone through what we do and all the different strategies uh, and types of properties that we go after. So what you have to do is you have to, you've got to uh, that process and document that process for a 30 day period. You do the transaction every day over a 30 day period and document exactly what you're doing. And as you go through that, you've got to be preparing for someone else to be doing that process, whatever that process. So if it's the, uh, if it's generating a list, whatever that list may be, okay, here's the exact list that I want. You go through a step step process, you build out, here's the exact leads that I want to be going after. Here's how to get them. Once you get the leads, here's how you start scrubbing that list and break it down to where it's a, it's a list of leads that you can actually work with. Then once you've done that, you go through and you, you detail and document out the marketing. This is a weekly, this is a weekly process. So day one, you build your list. Day two, you start the marketing campaign and the marketing processes that you're going to use. Day three, four, and five, you're calling and you're doing the marketing, you're cold calling and you're all of this. And so now you can have recorded conversations. You can have at least a script for somebody to go go by to prospect a lead or to qualify a lead. Now, the person that you bring in that you start training may not be ready to close deals. They're not going to be ready to close deals very quickly. So you want to have a script that at least allows them to qualify the leads before they bring a warm lead to you and say, okay, this one is ready to make an offer and contract. And then you can do the final negotiating process. So what you have to understand is that starting off, you're getting somebody that can do 50 to 75% of what you do. The, the total, the total investment, uh, real estate investment piece. Okay. So you're going to get somebody that can do 75 to 80% of the marketing and lead generating. Keep in mind, you've still got dispositions and you've got raising capital. The first one that you're going to focus on though, is the acquisitions. That's very transactional. It's very easy to have somebody come in and start replacing you on that. But that's only about 50% of what you do because you've still got the dispositions, which takes a little bit, and then the raising capital, right? So they're going to come in and they're going to have a script to go by so that as they start talking to leads, they can now get those leads qualified for you to come in and actually close them. Okay, so now because I got a troubleshoot, we got absolutely we got issues going out, on. So. so so now you've got somebody that you're you're training through and walking through the acquisitions process of how you're going to generate those leads, and so you're going to do that for 30 days, and then for the next 30 days, now you've got a documented process in your first 30 days. So your second 30 days, you're actually going to have that person come in and mirror you doing the same process. You're going to go through the the documented process. You're going to go through the scripts with them and they're going to mirror everything that you do. For the first 15 of those 30 days, you're going to do it and they're going to watch. For the next 15, you're going to start handing it off to them to start doing and you're going to sit there with them and see them through that process. They're going to pull the list. They're going to scrub the list. They're going to start doing the marketing. They're going to start doing the cold calling. And so now you're going through every single step of the process with them and empowering them to do that. And then after you've done that and they've mirrored you for 30 days, you're going to have them start doing it from there on out. And you're going to have them bring you all of the documentation that they go through with the step-by-step -step process, and you're going to sign off on it. So now you can go through and you can ask them what they did here, what they did here, what they did here, and they're going to just bring you the warm leads and they're going to bring you the process that they've gone through for you to sign off and say, okay, you've done this, you've done this, you've done the direct mail. Great. What direct mail did you use? Now you've done the ringless voicemail. You've done the, the SMS text messaging. You've done the email campaign. You've started cold calling and they've gone through the script and here's the people that they've talked to and they'll bring you a script of somebody that they talked to that was actually a warm lead ready to sell a property. And now they can bring those properties to you and you can start going through those. The next thing that you would start documenting out for them then at that point 
is how to go through the offer process, how to make an offer on a property. So how to run the due diligence, how to set up your uh, your market and, and within that market, how you're gonna create your offer package. So here's the types of property we're gonna look for in this market. Here's the expected rehabs that we're gonna do, the quality of rehab and so on and so forth. So that now that person can at least start doing a an initial offer. And then if any negotiations needs to come to you as a final negotiator, then they can do that at that point. So now you've you've created a systematic process for that person to follow, and they can do 75 to 80 percent of the acquisitions process. And after three, four, five months, they can actually do about 95 percent of it. Maybe there's a few deals, a few one-off deals that need you to come in and help do the final negotiating, the final contract writing. But at that point, you've now replaced yourself in the acquisitions process, and then you can move to the dispositions process and start working on the same thing. The one thing that you don't ever want to remove yourself from, though, is raising capital because that is done um, based on you. People are buying you up to your first $10 million. People are buying you and whatever it is that you provide them. So when you're raising capital, those capital investors are partnering with you. And so you want to be involved in that because it's your marketing, it's your message that's being shared with those with those investors at that point. So at now within about 90 days, you've replaced yourself in both acquisitions and dispositions at least 90 percent. So now you can focus your entire time on the raising capital piece with a little bit on the final acquisitions piece. But then the dispositions is very simple. All right, so Pat, does that make sense? We going, we good now with our yeah, with good. our stream. Sometimes I think it's just internet. Like I it didn't really be. change anything. It may be, and then all it, of a sudden it's like, hey, we're gonna work now. Yeah, I, I try be. to it run it on five G. Well, we got talked two that, different, we um, talked about that too. With maybe we need to just start running a hard <sighs> line in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we want to be on YouTube and everything at the same time anyway. Right. So it's all a process, folks. It's a process. Um, which is kind of like, I, I've taken a lot out of this stuff because, and we've talked about this too, man, I wish it would have taken me 60 days, but I, this is why I've started to work with some of the members of your team in building out what I want to offer and figure out how that's going to work. So it, this all goes back to you say, I wish it would have taken me 60 days. My first, my, my first time through real estate, it took me six years right. to figure out that I was doing it wrong. But that's, that's the thing, and I talk about this all the time. It's something that, uh, that my business coach, JT, has told me, that a smart person learns from their mistakes. They're not repeating their mistakes, but a genius learns from somebody else's, right? And so I learned from my mistakes. I changed them, and then I went in, and I saw, okay, well, here's what other people are doing. And then I realized, oh, well, if I'll just document this process out that I'm going through, when we actually started building our team, I was able to bring in acquisitions team and go through this process with them. Right. And so I, I stopped just randomly doing things like, okay, this week I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on DFW. This week I'm going to focus on Houston, then San Antonio, whatever it is, the, the different markets that we're in. Now it's like, well, no, we can do all of them at the exact same time. And we can have just a couple of people that if we'll train out on the process, look, do this on Monday, do this on Tuesday, do this on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and then start it back over the next week. Right. Now it's very easy, and we can go through and we can document that process. And so now when we go into a new market, there may be little pieces of the marketing that we change, or we may go after a different demographic of motivated sellers. And so we can tweak that at the beginning, but we tweak that in the, the list that we pull. Okay, here's the leads that we want to go after in this market. And everything else is the same. Then we go to this new market. Okay, here's the leads that we want to go after in this market, but everything else is the same. All the marketing that goes to those leads is the same. Now, depending on the lead, we may change the message that we're sending them in the marketing, right. but the process is still the same. Right. And so now that we have that documented process, we can literally go into whatever city, whatever market that we want to go into with the same systematic approach. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 cool. And, and that can work like we've talked about. And I always try to make this for everybody, too. Um, and that's it. This works for anything. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter the business. I, I mean, mean, you this... guys run 12 different businesses and now yeah. we're starting to kind of build a little media alliance thing out where we can offer, um, 
Vanilla Ice at your event and Pat and Ty and right. and social media advertisements. We're going to be doing stuff on the green screen very soon that you guys are going to see on some local Texas businesses page. And these advertisements are hysterical. Oh, yeah, they're phenomenal. I don't even have the guitar. It's going to be super funny. But I wouldn't have been able to make that transition unless I had steps and processes in place each week that I was expanding on what I can offer. Exactly. If I'm just playing guitar at the bar 10 nights a week... You know, there's only seven nights yeah, in the week. Can't I can't do that. it. Right. There's yeah, a you ceiling. Can't expand that. And I ran into that ceiling. And if you understand the, the message that you're trying to portray and you control that message, but there's, let's say that message is step nine and 10 of a 10 step process. Well, step one through eight, you can leverage off to somebody right. else. But you have to understand how to do it first. The, the, the biggest mistake that I see people make is they don't want to do one of the steps and one of the processes. So they don't do the work. So they don't do it. So then they don't understand how to show somebody how to do it. They've never documented it. They just tell somebody. And now they're telling somebody and that person doesn't fully understand the big picture. And so they have to retell them over and over and over. And then that system Sucks and that process time. never gets really created. You have to do whatever it takes first to build out that process. Once you've built out that process and you've done it, you can now hand it off to somebody right. else to do. Or if, like we were talking about the Photoshop thing. Yeah. I was in Phoenix mm -hmm. meeting with the Gold Level Media guys, uh -huh. and they're phenomenal at certain systems and processes that I'm really, really bad at. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just like I'm really good at voiceovers and songs and jingles and being the comedy uh, advertising character. They need that. I need the Photoshop thing. So this is why we're, we're an alliance, a media alliance, because I can align myself with some guys that already have business that are some of the best in right. the industry that I can bring something to the table and they can bring something, right. something to the table because I cannot do it all anymore. Yeah, It's exactly. already hard enough to do what I do. Yeah, well, and I mean, this, is, this goes back to some of the stuff that I've talked about before. Like, you can you can build a hundred thousand dollar business by yourself right but if you want to grow above that you have to start being able to leverage right otherwise you know what got you to a hundred thousand isn't what's going to get you to a million or ten million and you can't, you can't show you, up exactly. seven days a week and do everything and and exactly and do everything there's only so much that you can do if I have to actually run my acquisitions and dispositions and raising capital I don't have time to go speak on a stage I don't have time to run a coaching business I don't have time to run our import right. business or any of the other businesses that we run. So you either bring in the expert or you figure out how to do it yourself and teach somebody. Exactly. So at what point do you bring in the expert? Well, I think you start That's bringing them question, in. Yeah, right? you start bringing them in once you understand the entire process, step one through 10 or whatever that is. Right. So in our construction company, I couldn't bring in a project manager until I could walk the project manager on every project and say, this is what I want. Now, if they run into one-offs, like I went, uh, we have, a, we have a, a major burnout house, a house that had a major fire in it. So, uh, I mean, a significant portion of the house is completely being reframed. The exterior, rear exterior wall of the house was completely burnt off, so we're doing an add-on. So this is a, a one-off compared to what we typically do. So I walked the construction manager starting out that works for us on the project. He understands what we're doing on the project, but there's little steps along the way that he doesn't understand. And so I went back over there on Monday when I got back into town with him, I guess yesterday, and, and we walked it together. So that way we've gotten through the rough end electrical and plumbing and a lot of the framing and there were some, there were some questions. We had a couple of headers that go in and stuff like that. There were some questions that he had on some of the walls and stuff like that. And so I was able to go over there and answer those questions, walk through the plumbing with him. We noticed a couple of little issues. The um, the shower drain wasn't square to the way that we wanted it to look in the shower. And so it's just kind of how to understand some things when they're in there raw and it's not finished out. Stuff that would be obvious once it's finished out, but it's really hard to see when it's, when it's just roughed in. You've got concrete and walls with no sheetrock up and plumbing and electrical ran. Got it. And so I was able to walk in and kind of walk that with him. So that's, that's that other 10%, you know, that you can't really ever hand off. You have to you have to know that you're always going to have there's 10 a human in your business. There's a human, a human element, element to yeah. that, right? So I've gone through, and he has a checklist mm -hmm. of here's the construction process, here's what happens, here's kind of the weekly layout of when it happens, in what order it happens, so that windows don't go in after sheetrock has already been done, or whatever the case may be. You know, we've already done sheetrock, and now we need to do 
run electrical. Well, it's kind of too late for that. So it's a step-by-step -step process that lays it out and say, go in this order. But in this order, there's going to be a few things that you may not understand. So come talk to me and we'll, I'll, I'll right. help you through that process. Yeah. So it's, and I mean, it's the same thing in any business. You've got to be able to, you can, you can only bring somebody in once you understand it a hundred percent or 98% mm -hmm. and you've documented out the process that you want done. If right. you bring somebody in before you've documented out that process, then you're going to be wasting a bunch of time telling them how to do what it is that you want done. I agree. Instead of just saying, okay, I want you to do this, and here's the process of how to do this. Come ask me if you have any questions, if you get stuck somewhere, but don't come ask me until you've already tried to do it. Right. Or you know that person is the expert. Like, well, absolutely. Right? But so, still, like, you, you put Dennis to... Rodman on the team because you know he's going to get the rebound. Exactly. But you tell him... You, you've got to give them a measurable value quantity to got get it. to. Okay, this is what I want to do. Okay, you may know how to manage a construction project, but you're not only going to be managing one, you're going to be managing eight in this market. And right. here's what that looks like, and this is the order that I want you to go in. So, yeah, it. absolutely. You still have to be able to convey your message and what it is, the big picture that you're wanting to get done. Because it's your vision in the long run anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely. I dig it. All right, so we've got some questions. I've got three great questions for today that we're going to go through and answer and actually the third one uh, fit in really well with this week's replace yourself in 60 days so first question what are the best ways to handle and overcome objections and they were referencing this question uh, in reference to when you're cold calling and you're getting objections when you're making offers but this is all. This is this is the case in almost any negotiation. Whether you're selling something, you're buying a property at a discount, or whatever the case may be, you want to you want to address all the objections. You want to come up with the objections. This is thinking eight moves ahead. What are the objections you're going to get before they're even asked, and you want to start addressing those objections right. in your offer. Okay, so you want to go through and start addressing any known objections that you're going to get before they're asked and you want to offer options. That's why that's why I don't come in and so many people now are just I'll, I'll give you this cash offer. It's a low cash offer, right? But they're not offering options and so they never know what it is that is affecting the seller's situation. Why is the seller selling and what what is the problem that they have and how can you best solve that problem? So you've got to come in having two, three, maybe four options ready to offer that seller so that you can overcome any objections that they have because they may they may not need to be they may not need just cash or a low cash offer. They may have underlying circumstances they need help moving or relocating and they don't care about the cash. They all they care about is getting relocated from where they are to the new state that they're having to get relocated to in a two week time frame or whatever the case may be. So you've got to have some options available and then start asking qualifying questions on the front end. You want to ask a question and then get the other person talking. And the more that other person talks, the more they're going to tell you what their problems are. Right. And so that's what you want to do. You want to get them to open up. So you want to ask qualifying questions that are lead generating questions that are going to get them to lead you to what problem it is that they have. And then as you're asking those questions, in those questions, you want to overcome any objections that they might have on the front end. Okay? So then, once you get those objections answered on the front end that you can, you want to start mirroring and ask rhetorical questions. You want to ask questions that are obvious to the seller and get them leading into an obvious answer, and that obvious answer is going to be a yes to one of the three options that you've offered them. And you always offer three options. You don't, you don't want to give somebody one option. Here's your only option. It's a yes or a no. Well, I'm good at that. Right? <laughs> yeah, you don't want to just, here's, here it is. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you this one cash offer. It's a low cash offer, yes or no. Oh, call me back when you're ready. Yeah, right? you got to have multiple things for anybody yeah, in any you situation. you got to have multiple options. But then you don't want to have so many options. Uh, and I used this reference last week uh, at one of the events that I was speaking at. You know, three, maybe four options is all that you want to get because a confused mind doesn't know what to do at that point. And so I was eating at uh, BJ's restaurant last week. And you go into BJ's and the food is pretty good. I mean, for if you're just trying to eat quick and you're not looking for like a, a really nice dining place, but the food's pretty good. But they have a just a plethora of food, like all different kinds. I mean, like a 15 page menu. Right. And so 
it's so bad that either you're like super hungry, but nothing sounds good, and you start looking through, and you get confused, and you're like, well, I wanted that, and then I want this, and now, now I don't even know what it is that I want. Or you end up like, in my case, last week, I ordered like five different entrees. And, and so it, it's just confusion. You don't want to offer somebody so much that they get confused and then they don't know where it is that they want to move forward. And so that's why when we're making offers, we're making three different offers. And we always give somebody three different offers. And then we have one that we're really leaning towards. And so we'll ask rhetorical questions hmm. that will lead that person to that option. That that option, we want to make that option look best to the person. And so we'll ask rhetorical questions that will lead them into that option and make it look like the other op the other options are good options, but it's so obvious that this third option is the one that they need to go with. We're leading them into that. And so then the whole qualifying process is about that. And then the third thing and the final thing that you really want to focus on is assumptive based communication. You want to assume that we're going to do this business together. Well, yeah. Assume that we're going to do business together and I'm going to buy your house. Assume that we're going to invest together and we're going to partner together. It's assumptive based closing the entire time. So it's we and how can we do this together and I want to make sure that you are getting everything out of this uh, this negotiation and this deal that it is that you need. Whatever whatever the case may be, you want right. to assume all the way through that we're going to do business together. And then that's going to lead somebody into whatever whatever option that you want them I to go that. with. Right. Well, especially in real estate. I mean, you're you guys are providing a solution for people that are already selling their home anyway. Ab well, in in a lot of cases, they don't know that they're selling their home. A lot of the cases, we're coming in to solve a problem. Right. Okay? And so if if all you're doing is focusing on the money, that's going to come off in the very beginning. Okay. We're solving a problem. Money is the result of solving that problem. But if all you're focusing on is the money, that's the case with all these big wholesalers right now is all these big wholesaling companies are focusing on the money and on the deal. And if that's all you're focusing on, you're not coming in to solve the problem. You're just running through leads as fast as you can to get the ones that will say yes to your low cash offer. But if you're coming in to solve the problem and you're focused on the problem, whenever you, as you work through as you work through the questions and the qualifying questions, you're going to start finding out what that problem is and what's the best way to solve it. And so when you come with the, the, the service mentality that I'm coming to serve and solve whatever problem it is that you have, then more opportunities start opening up. Right. And, and then that's when you figure out what is the best option that you can offer this person. That was what I was going to say about options because mm -hmm. Boone and I talked about that a lot. There's so many different options that just I know the terminology. There's the subject to and the yeah. owner finance and the wholesale and the whole tail. And there's all these different ways. Yeah, I mean there's different there's different acquisitions and disposition strategies. So obviously. it just depends so, on what the You know, I mean I could go in every single time and offer somebody a low cash offer. But that doesn't mean that that's what solves their problem. Right. That, that may not solve their problem. I got it. I mean we're working on a deal right now that um, somebody just needed a little bit of capital to fix up their house but they own their house free and clear. They don't want to move out of their house. Well, I can come in and do a first position lien with that person to get them the capital to fix up their house. And so there's there's ways now I've got basically an owner finance buyer that's already living in the house that I turn around and owner finance it to if we help bring the capital to the table to help like fix it. that house up. Well, it's just like everybody doesn't need a podcast. Right. If someone just offers podcasting, they're going to tell you everyone needs a podcast. Exactly. But I think that if I want to approach people and do business with as many people as possible, and like you said, offer the right solution, yeah. well, someone might need me to just be funny in front of the green screen, and they post that every week. Right. They exactly. don't want the guitar. They don't want a song. They just right. want me to be funny. Yeah. This other person might like want to present. They not want the jingle or whatever. Right. The case may so be, yeah. I need to be. Um, I don't need to have a full book, but I need a menu. Exactly. Of what I deliver. Yeah. Some people don't want a cheeseburger. They want two burgers on that thing. Yeah. With extra cheese. Right. They need two burgers. You got to have, you gotta have that options. Exactly. <laughs> so then the next one is, uh, the next question that I had, is it better to find the deal first or the buyer first? So it, it's twofold. You're, you have to have leads first. So you always want to start your lead generation process. The buyers will fill in, but you want to do that simultaneously. If you have a preset buyers list already and you start finding buyers, you know what kind of deals they're looking for. So then as the deals come in, you can you can easily flow those deals to the to the right buyer. 
But if you don't have any deal flow, then it doesn't matter if you have the buyer. So you've got to start focusing on the acquisitions process, build out your acquisitions process. And as you're doing that, you're working on building out your buyers. And that's if you're just focusing on wholesaling. Again, that's when you're, you're only focusing on one way to solve people's problems. You've got to come in and those buyers, they're looking to invest in real estate. It doesn't mean that they're looking to just buy wholesale deals from you. They may want to be partnering. They may want to do deals together, whatever the deal may be. So if you're coming in to serve the sell, the seller first, figure out the option with the seller that, that, or figure out the problem with the seller and what option meets their problem, then you can come in and figure out, okay, well now I've got this deal and you don't know what the best exit strategy is. So you've got to, you've got to have the leads first, focus on the leads. Focus on the process, be a product of the product, okay? So you build out your process. The process first is lead generate. We've got to have leads. We've got to have property deals. So as the property deals come in, then you start building your buyer's database. You start building your partner database. You start raising the capital. At any given time, we have, we have buyers that buy wholesale properties from us. We have investors that invest with us. We have lenders that lend to us. So we have multiple options on things that we can do to then solve the problem of the seller. And if all you're focusing on is, well, I'm going to be a wholesaler or I have no money to get started. So I'm going to focus only on wholesaling. Like I had no money when I got started and I figured out like, yeah, our first couple of deals were wholesale deals, but really quickly we started ra within the first 45 days, we were raising capital and bringing in partners to buy deals with us because I knew that, wholesaling is transactional. Yeah, you make a may you may make a larger fee, quote unquote fee than you do than than you would if you were a realtor, but it's still transactional. The minute you stop lead generating and the minute you stop having deals or the minute you stop wholesaling, you cut off your income source. And we talked and about that with, else, with the right? guitar jobs. Once exactly. you stop. And so so many people are talking about I'm, I'm getting into real estate to build a legacy. Well, building a transactional business within real estate is not building a legacy because the minute that that stops, the minute your income mm -hmm. stops and you have no value, you've got to have a portfolio of properties to have a, to have a legacy, to have a lasting legacy. So then you got assets. cash flow and equity. Exactly. You got to own assets. You got to own assets and businesses. And if you don't own assets and own businesses, you're not building a legacy. You just have a transactional business. And so that's why I don't focus on wholesaling. Yeah, it's a way to 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 get cash and wealth quickly, but it doesn't accumulate wealth for you over a long term. It's transactional. So you've got to be doing both transactional and transformational in your business if you want to build a legacy and have a business that's sustainable. A, 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 a wholesale business is not sustainable. It's very difficult. Like once you stop that transaction, it's done. And a, a, a portfolio or owning assets is transformational. That that can be passed down. That can that can build wealth to where where you don't actually have to be there working. I dig it, man. And then number three, as a new real estate investor, should I spend more time focusing on acquisitions teams or dispositions teams? So this goes back to replacing yourself in 60 days. First of all, you're not going to be focusing on either team first. You're going to be focusing on you and the process. Again, build out the process. Focus on the process and the results will come. So First, you're going to want to focus on your building out your process around your acquisitions because that's the easiest transactional part to hand off. Okay, so you you as a new real estate investor are going to be doing acquisitions, dispositions, and raising capital starting out. But you're going to be building the process around the acquisitions first. You're documenting that acquisitions process so that in 30 days you can bring somebody in to start doing that acquisitions process and mirroring you for the next 30 days. So as far as focusing on a team, don't focus on a team yet. Focus on the process and documenting that process. Once you've documented that process and you're ready to start training somebody in that process, then you can bring in somebody on the acquisition side. The disposition side is a little bit more simple because you can build out a small niche of people that you're going to start disposing to and you can start building out your pipeline. Like for us, we've got a pipeline of 400 qualified leads for either our tenant buyer program or our, our rentals in, in some of our markets. And so as you start building out that pipeline, 
then all it is is, well, I've got a deal. What am I going to do with this deal? Am I going to rent it out? Am I going to finance it? Or am I going to wholesale it? Then you go to that pipeline of leads and the correct source of pipeline, and then you just offer that product. Hey, I've got a new product. Here's the, here's the deal. And, and you know whether you're going to in it, uh, offer it to your renters or your tenant buyers or your cash buyers. And that becomes much more simple. And so you're going to focus on the acquisitions first, training out that acquisitions person. You're going to keep doing the dispositions and the raising capital. And then, then you're going to start focusing on documenting the dispositions process and then hand that off to a new person. And now you've split up acquisitions from dispositions. So you're not training your competition, for instance, and you're allowing, if you have people that are focused on, a team focused on acquisitions, you can now start growing your markets much quicker than if you had somebody all, and, and they did both acquisitions and dispositions. Now basically that person can only do one or two markets and then you have to bring in a new person and train them to go into a new market. If somebody is trained in acquisitions, they can do five, six markets in acquisitions. Somebody's trained in dispositions, they can do those same five or six markets. And so it's because it's the same systematic process. Right. Yeah, I have to process sometimes when exactly. you're talking. So, so if I'm looking off into space, it's because I'm like you're thinking through, doing like the it. visual in my yeah. head. Yeah, I need the visual. Oh, so I have to create it for myself. Sometimes. Segregation of duties. And this is one thing that, that I learned in my accounting degree is basically you don't want to train one person to do every bit of your business because if you do, they can steal from you. They can steal business from you. They can steal clients from you. They can steal investors from you. They can leave, and you've already trained them on exactly what to do, and they have no reason to stay. Right. But if you build a team that is incentivized to do whatever it is that they do, and you build an atmosphere that wants that, that people want to be there, and then you focus on okay, here's what I, here's the job that I need done. And you find a person that does that type of job. Right. And so, and I'm not saying a transactional, actual job. You want to like, there's multiple personality profiles and things like that. You want, you don't want somebody that is a, on a disc profile, a high C personality on a sales or on the phone. You want a high C personality doing a transactional process or doing accounting or think something like that they are gonna clamor up and they're not gonna be very good on the phone if you ask them to get on the phone and sell a property or buy a property. On the flip side, you don't want somebody that's like a high I or a high D sitting in a cubicle doing a transactional task that's the same thing over and over and over because they're gonna go crazy and they're not gonna be efficient and optimized at that. That's somebody that wants to be on the phone selling or, or buying and something like that. Right. So you wanna, Okay, here's what I need. Here's I need an acquisitions person. So if I need an acquisition person, they're going to be on the phone. They're going to be doing this and this, and it's a little bit systematic. So you want somebody that has some some S personality with maybe I or a little bit of D that is very good on the phone and and talking to people. So, I dig it. Psychologist Ty. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think I'm. Uh... I don't even remember. I'd have to go back and look at the ratings, but I'm like the guy that like leaves the dishes a little bit off, and then like my wife is the person that has to have the dishes perfect. Perfect, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's like, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. get you, along. You, you're definitely right-brained, right? Brained, right? A right-brained is somebody that's going to kind of think and think outside the box. Right. Left brain, it's more black and white and very analytical and and very systematic process approach. Right, and that's why I need those behind me to allow me to focus on my strengths and my own offerings yeah, and, and to the marketplace. Needed, well, it's like it's like when Malia started talking to you about KPIs, right? You're right brain and so right. I, I work right brain when I start working unless you hand me a deal to analyze. And so when you hand me a deal to analyze, my left brain kicks in and I start focusing on the numbers in Excel and things like that. Right. But that's been kind of a trained approach. I had to train my mind to do that. And so right brain people tend to be like, oh, there's a rabbit, there's a shiny object, and you get all over the place. Yeah. And it's very difficult for you to start something and see it all the way through to the finish. Right. But if you have measurables, like this is what I have to get to. Okay, if I know that I need to make 10 phone calls this morning, well, then I can go through and start checking that off and right. I can create that. And so that's where kind of Malia talk to you, you know, you're very, very right brain. And so Malia then give you measurables. Well, if you'll do this and focus on this process, then the results will come. Right. And for a right brain person to build that process out, it's very difficult. 
And so you have to focus, or if somebody has helped you build that that approach out, well, then, then I can go execute. You know exactly it. what you need to do and execute. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I dig that. All right. Cool. You're good. You guys are good. If you have questions, let us know. Uh, we appreciate you guys. Obviously, if you need to ask Ty questions, you can also yeah, DM the page. Absolutely. Um, are you here next week? Uh, next week, I'm not. I'm here the rest of this week. Uh, next week, I'll be out. I'm back in, uh, let's say I'm going to be in Florida, in Georgia, and then one other location. You guys might be stuck with the B Squad, Pat and Boone, next week. We might have to, there we go. We might have to sharpen up. No NASA t shirts. Anyway, <laughs> we'll see you guys soon. And uh, hopefully, I'll see some of you guys in Houston this weekend. I'm jamming at an event, a real estate event down there. If you don't have your tickets, Message me. I can help you get them. All my affiliate money is going to Beat Kids Cancer, uh, RJ Bates Fund. He runs Titanium Investments here in Dallas. So that's what we do. We keep it real. We keep it fresh. And we keep the community alive. We love you guys. We'll see you soon. Fantastic.